Well, good morning, everyone. There, there we go. Our very cool slides today are thanks to Elise Bolger, who I'll be introducing in a minute. So if you like the slides, as I do, thanks to Elise. So uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, I'm Teresa Clark. I'm a Deputy Division Director in uh, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and I'm the Executive Lead for our fusion rulemaking. And I'm delighted to be with you to uh, introduce our panel discussion for today, and also to congratulate all of you for coming here and not to my buddy's advanced reactor session. Um, so he's going to be over there complaining about the time slot. I'm over here crowing that I stole his audience. So that's great. And uh, appreciate all of you taking the time today to hear about a topic that's really capturing a lot of people's imagination, is keeping us excited and interested in how we're building the foundations for a potential new industry here. And, um, and there's a lot going on, as you'll hear about from several diverse perspectives on our panel today. So, like I said, I'm here from the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission, but these fusion activities are going on in regulatory perspectives, in private industry, in government-funded research, um, and in a lot of different ways. And you'll hear all of those perspectives. So uh, I think our next slide, which I have the ability to control, um, I'll introduce our panelists. I'm sure they'll say a little bit about themselves in their own presentations, but just to give you a flavor for what you'll be hearing. Uh, first up is Andrew Holland, who's the CEO of the Fusion Industry Association. And as he'll say, that's a collective of a lot of private groups that are interested in developing fusion across the country uh, and beyond. Then we'll hear from Dr. Scott Shu, who works for the Department of Energy, which is supporting a lot of those research activities. Our own Elise Bolger is going to talk about our fusion rulemaking activities, which are super underway. We have another in our series of public meetings this Monday, so cross-promote for that. Um, and I'm sure she will as well. Uh, she's one of the technical leads for that rulemaking project. And then because we are regulating fusion under the byproduct materials framework, that means that we get to leverage our partnerships with the agreement states. So 39 out of 50 states in the U.S. are agreement states, which means they share regulatory authority with us on regulating byproduct materials. And so that's already underway nationwide for over 17,000 licensees using applications as diverse as smoke detectors to huge commercial irradiators that sterilize medical equipment and food to gauges to nuclear medicine and all kinds of different applications. And it's this variety and different scale across the country that gives us a lot of confidence that we can scale up in fusion as well. So Beth Shelton is representing the Organization of Agreement States, which is the collective of those 39 states, um, as well as perhaps a little bit from her role in Tennessee. So really looking forward to hearing from all of these panelists, and we'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Andrew, you're up. All right. Do I get this? Oh, do I, should I go up there? I can do that. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, great to be here. Last panel of the session. Uh, so uh, I, I appreciate you all staying instead of catching the early flight home. Uh, hopefully, we can entertain you enough uh, and give you enough to, to mull over about what's happening in fusion and, and where everything's coming to make it worth your while. Um, I am uh, CEO of the Fusion Industry Association. Uh, and. Uh, we're going to, I'll talk a little bit here today about the building the safety and regulatory certainty for the, the fusion industry, uh, our work with the NRC, and, uh, and going forward elsewhere. So what, are, what is the FIA? We are the unified voice of the private fusion industry. We have 37 member companies from around the world. 24 of those companies are here in the United States. Um, we bring people together. I, I, I like to say that the FIA does the, the background work of herding the cats to make sure that we can all talk uh, in one voice. Uh, we think it's especially useful to talk in one voice towards the NRC and to regulators around the world. Um, fusion is by no means a, a single technology. The, the techno technology subset here is extremely diverse. 
Uh, so getting every, everybody on the same page is oftentimes a challenge, and we appreciate the, the NRC's uh, willingness to engage in this uh, educational process over multiple years. Um, our companies are the, the, the fusion developers, and, our, and we have affiliate members uh, from around the world who represent everything from the supply chain to the law firms to the NGOs to the um, end users and utilities that will be uh, distributing the power. Our goal is to accelerate fusion energy. Simply put, our goal, we, we think fusion is so, so important that we should do everything we can right now so that we can get it onto the grid as fast as possible and then we can scale it once we get to that point. This is our membership here, as I said. We have uh, 37 member companies all around the world, um, a, a, a broad and diverse group uh, across multiple technologies. So where are we today? Um, we do an annual report on the state of the fusion industry. This, this report is from released in July of last year, so it's, it is about nine months old, and, and in a new industry, you'd expect things to change quickly, so um, we'll be putting out our, our next report in, in July, and we're, we're just about to start the survey uh, to see where things are. But, but this is the best, uh, best detailed knowledge of, of where things are in the fusion industry. $6.2 billion in investment into fusion companies are around the world. 43 verified private fusion companies. And those, those range in scale from, you know, hundreds of people, 500, 600 employees, and, and uh, over a billion dollars, $2 billion in investment, down to companies that are little more than a good idea on paper and, and have raised a couple hundred thousand dollars. It, it diverse, diverse set. Um, our companies are increasingly optimistic on time scales. You'd think, you know, given the experience in, uh, from both our cousins in the nuclear fission world and, and also experience in the fusion world, that, that sometimes those, the, the reputation is those time horizons go further on. But in, in, in fact, what we've seen is that as we've done this survey over three years now, uh, companies are increasingly optimistic that they're going to get to that, uh, that goal of having fusion energy uh, onto the grid in the 2030s or before. This is really important. Um, and we, the, other, the other key thing that came out of this report that was really new was there a growing interest from governments around the world in public-private partnerships. Um, over, I think it was 18 companies uh, within those 43 were engaged in some form of public-private partnership and the total dollars that were invested in these, you know, government public-private partnerships uh, doubled in, uh, in, in that last year from, I think, 150-something million to um, nearly 300 million. So why is this, why is this happening now? And I'm not going to read the whole slide, mostly because I don't have my glasses on and can't, can't read it there. But, um, but, but basically, and, and actually I'll give credit to, to Scott uh, next to me here for putting together this, this chart, which shows the historical progress towards fusion energy. I think that there's often this, you all have probably heard the bad joke, I'm not even going to repeat it, but there's, there's enough uh, feeling and understanding from people in the energy world and, and the fission world that says, well, what have you done? You know, it, 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 you've, you've been working on fusion and, and you haven't gotten there. Well, what this slide shows is that there is continuous progress on a logarithmic scale over time towards that break-even moment. It's really important to say that what that means, what that slide means, is that, and what all of the com combination of all of these, uh, applying these, these new technologies, high-speed computing, AI, all this sort of stuff, to fusion, what that means is that we're confident, our companies are confident that when they build the next thing, it will work. And that's new in fusion. The fact that you can say, we're going to build this thing and it's going to work, is really important unlocks a lot of investment uh, and allows us to iterate faster, move faster. And so that leads us to where, where we are on industry's timeline. I talked about kind of the, the excitement and understanding of this. So, so where we stand today is, we, oops, we've got, it, we've, we're at this transition moment from 60 years of research into company, multiple companies building the scientific proof of concept. 
Last I checked, it's 2024, so to me, that, that's the mid-2020s. Uh, so we have multiple companies right now building their scientific proof of concept machine. These are the machines that will show that fusion can be produced at a, at a commercially relevant scale. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 these are not pilot plants, to be clear. These are the step before pilot plants. Um, and, of course, we, we already saw this uh, a year and a bit ago at Lawrence Livermore National Lab when the, um, the, the NIF fired, uh, fired a shot that showed that, um, you know, you could get to that break, breakthrough, break-even moment. And now they've, they've repeated it multiple times. And so, so the analogy here is that we are, if, if you look at the aerospace industry, we're post-1903. The Wright brothers have already f flown their airplane. Doesn't mean they're selling anything yet. But we, the Wright brothers have, have flown their airplane. People are starting to realize that this is coming and, and it could change everything. So as you think through timelines here, once you get the scientific proof of concept, then you move swiftly into designing and building pilot plants. Then, as you do that, you're operating the pilot plants in the early 2030s. And then in the mid-2030s and before, this is about rapid scale up and global deployment. Now, to be clear, this doesn't just happen on its own. Each of these steps requires pretty significant investment, pretty significant capital, pretty significant scale up. But at each of these steps, it's also about reducing risk so that, that, in, that investment becomes more certain uh, and the ability of, of investors to feel confidence grows. So let's talk about regulation. Um, the FIA, since we were founded, we were, we were founded as a small initiative in 2018 um, before becoming a, a, a spin-off into a, a full-fledged association in 2021. But even before then, we put out a, a white paper in the summer of 2020 outlining where and how fusion should be regulated in the United States. And I'm going to read this because I think it's important because we outlined what we thought was, was important from the start. We need a regulatory framework that explicitly and permanently removes fusion energy from the regulatory approaches that the federal government has taken towards fission power plants. That's what we mean when we say regulatory certainty and what we mean when we say that regulation should be fit for purpose. The truth is, is that fission doesn't fit for fusion. The safety risks are completely different. So th to talk a little bit, and this is again, a small writing, so I'm not going to read it all, um, but the, the scope of the commercial fusion power plants in the United States. This is from a survey we did during this uh, NRC process um, for, to give you kind of an outline, and, and we'll probably hear more from Elise on, on what the process has looked like. But, you know, f we've been engaged with the NRC here since 2020, so over three years of really good, detailed engagement. Um, so, so a couple of things that, that we, we put out based on our survey here. Uh, of course, no usage of special nu nuclear materials, no uranium or plutonium. So that means that, you know, it, it's appropriate to, to be out of that utilization facility approach. You know, the, those two bullets in the middle, what that means is that the failure mode for fusion is it turns off automatically. And that's, that's fundamentally what, may, what we think makes fusion safe and why it's, why it's important. The other thing that I want you all to take away from here is that the commercial companies are almost 100% looking to build fusion power plants that are of a smaller size and scale than the fusion power plants, than, than the current existing fleet of nuclear power plants and the fusion power plants uh, that were originally thought of in the, the government demo scale, which were thought to be you know, up to three gigawatts electric. Um, that's not what, what companies are looking for. Companies are, are building things that are more on the scale of combined cycle uh, gas power plants, 200, 300 megawatts, up to 500 megawatts. Um, but you know, when you talk to your customers, it turns out that's what they want. And then the scope of hazards to, to Again, you'll, you'll have this, and you can, you can look at this online. Um, under normal operation, the hazards are, are clear. It's, uh, it is a fusion produces a lot of neutrons, uh, and so you have to protect your workers, and you have to shield it. Um, and then fusion materials become activated. 
So there is, uh, there is a waste stream produced, uh, and that, that waste has to, be, um, has to be safely dealt with and disposed of in low-level waste uh, repositories. Accidents, the maximum uh, credible accident is a loss of vacuum. And, you know, <laughs> it's pretty hard to get to a loss of vacuum. Um, but the maximum credible is, is a loss of vacuum. And, and so what that means is the, um, if, if the containment vessel breaks and, and air rushes in, then the, the maximum radiological dose is the amount of fuel and activated material within the chamber. So it's limited by the very small amount that's within that chamber. Of course, we know that we have to, we know that there's tritium in many of these devices, and, and we know how to deal with tritium, but we have to do it. You have to do the work, and the regulators have to make sure that we are doing the work. Um, so we're excited about the, the vote uh, last year uh, to, by a bipartisan five, five to zero unanimous majority to initiate the rulemaking under the byproduct materials regulatory regime. We think it's not only the, uh, you know, the, the right choice for uh, encouraging innovation among the fusion industry, but also for, it's the right choice to ensure safety and security uh, of the public. And so what's next? I want to kind of finish here what, uh, with, you know, saying thank you to the NRC for, for the good uh, engagement. We have, we have another meeting coming up Monday. Uh, there's going to be more, and we're going to get a, a final, final rulemaking and, and um, a new reg out, you know, within the year. So, so we're starting to think about what's next. Well, we look around the world, it's what's next is in international harmonization. The IAEA, of course, is, is getting more and more engaged, and we're having to send people over there. And, you know, we were just talking, Teresa and Scott are, you know, have been over there and involved. Um, but it, we think it's really important to start thinking about what is the, the way that we harmonize all together. I put here, uh, if you look at, at, at the logos, German. Uh, UK Health and Safety Executive, US NRC, um, the EU uh, regulators, Japanese regulator, and, and Canadian CNS, uh, CNSC. Uh, put these all together, I think you can achieve a regulatory harmonization among those groups and then go work with the IAEA and show that that's the way that you regulate fusion and, and how you deploy it around the world. And then also we're really pleased to have, uh, have Beth here from the uh, uh, from Tennessee, and, and we we're already engaging with agreement states around the world to make sure that they have the capacity here to regulate this and, and get it done in, in, a, in an important way. And then the other thing that I'd kind of encourage folks to think about on what's next is about scale. You know, how do we make sure that as companies are getting there, are moving towards not just a pilot plant, but beyond? Our companies have really ambitious plans to scale and to, as soon as they, they figure this out, to start moving these through an assembly line process and getting them out as fast as possible. How can we ensure that the NRC agreement states are able to scale this out? I think that's a, that's a really interesting challenge to make sure that, that this is, we don't want, um, you know, a regulatory process to slow it down, but we also want to make sure that the regula regulatory process is um, clear. And, in, and shows that there is public, uh, shows the public that it, it is safe. So with that, I'm gonna close and say, these are our affiliate members right now. You can see, you know, many of them are, are involved in, uh, in, in the, the broader nuclear industry. Uh, if you don't see your company's name on here and you wanna get involved, shoot me a line, uh, fusionindustryassociation.org. Uh, we, we think membership is a, a good cost benefit. So, so come join us and, and uh, look forward to, to your questions afterwards. Thanks, Andrew. Really appreciate that. And since you cross-promoted our meeting next week, I'll cross-promote <laughs> your meeting. The Fusion Industry As Association has their annual meeting next yeah. week as yeah, well. Sure so <laughs> next up is Scott. So pleased to hear your remarks, Scott. Okay, greetings everyone. Um, I am Scott Hsu, a senior advisor to the DOE Undersecretary for Science and Innovation, uh, Dr. Geraldine Richmond, and also DOE's lead fusion coordinator. 
I'm really happy to be here today. Um, I, I think, you know, we'll reach some uh, new faces and new audience today, which is great. Um, I often uh, speak more to, uh, to fusion advocates, uh, so speaking amongst ourselves a little more often, so great to speak to some new folks. Um, also, in this talk, I'd like to talk about the U.S. bold decadal vision for commercial fusion energy. Um, the session organizers, uh, Teresa, Duncan, and Alice, uh, kind of asked me to talk about uh, what the U.S. government and also what the DOE is doing right now for, for fusion energy, accelerating our efforts in fusion uh, energy research and development. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that's what I'll do. And I'll also give some kind of higher level uh, remarks about fusion too, just because like I said, there may be some um, uh, new audience members here to fusion. So I'll, I'll just start at the, at the top here. F fusion has the potential uh, to be a safe, on-demand, abundant, non-carbon emitting and globally scalable energy source. That, that's why we're here, that's why we're excited about it. Um, the potential uses, of course, everyone looks at electricity generation, but I do want to point out that the fusion could be used for uh, industrial processes, production of transportation fuels, desalination, uh, um, really, it, it, can, it could do a lot of other things. Um, the potential benefits, you know, many of you probably heard, but I'll just repeat here. It's, it's firm, on-demand, and no carbon emissions. It's globally scalable, uh, low land use, could potentially site it uh, near cities, um, and it has manageable risks uh, relating to both radioactive waste and to uh, nuclear proliferation concerns. Of course, um, and I'm glad Andrew already talked about this a little bit, but you know, we want to be very honest and transparent about the safety uh, considerations and the risks of fusion. So there is mildly radioactive tritium uh, in the DT uh, fusion designs at least. Um, there are short-lived neutron activated structural materials, so you do need a waste uh, disposition strategy. Um, and of course it has the conventional risks of any large industrial facility. Um, so strong technical progress and private investments in recent years, um, you know, over the past decade or so, I would say especially a warrant a new U.S. strategy for fusion research development and demonstration. Andrew showed this plot. Um, this is showing the figure of merit we call the triple product. It's the fuel density times the ion temperature times how long you can confine your energy in your fusion system, uh, NT tau. Um, and so you see that over the decades that we have pursued fusion R&D, really a dramatic progress was made, and a lot of people like to cite that the initial rise in the uh, tokamak, um, that first line that gets up toward a uh, scientific break even, uh, occurred over just a couple of decades, um, you know, four plus orders of magnitude increase in that figure of merit. And of course, most recently, as Andrew mentioned, um, the National Ignition Facility achieved for the very first time what we call scientific energy break-even, meaning that the fusion energy released exceeded the laser input energy used to initiate and to heat the reactions. Um, so that's an example of, um, you know, a level of maturity in the scientific uh, ability, our, our scientific ability uh, in, in fusion energy. But similarly, um, also building on many decades of public investments in fusion, the enabling technologies for fusion have also um, advanced. And one very uh, good example recently um, is the demonstration of a 20 Tesla fusion scale magnet using high temperature superconducting technology by Commonwealth Fusion Systems. And while that was an incredible uh, technological achievement in its own right, I th the, the real exciting thing is that it opens up new pathways uh, toward uh, smaller designs for magnetic confinement systems, including tokamaks. And um, this plot, uh, prepared by my uh, our colleague at ARPA-E, Sam Rizel, um, shows over the past decade or so how the private sector funding uh, especially the three and five year averages, have, have started to exceed the DOE funding to the Fusion Energy Sciences Program. And so that is very important in terms of how we think about our uh, national strategy moving forward. Uh, so in part um, due to those developments, 
in March 2022, the White House held a summit called Developing a Bold Decadal Vision for Commercial Fusion Energy. Um, the discussions there and the, and the follow-on uh, activities um, from that event um, are very much guided by a 2021 National Academies report entitled Bringing Fusion to the U.S. Grid. And I'll just mention some key abbreviated recommendations from that report. That DOE and the private sector should demonstrate net electricity in a fusion pilot plant in the 2030s. DOE should move forward now via public-private partnerships to resolve key scientific and technological challenges needed to bring fusion to commercial viability, and that urgent investments, of course, are needed by DOE and the private industry. So what is the bold decadal vision in a single slide? Um, I'll first say that the bold decadal vision is an element of the White House's innovation agenda to help meet 2050 climate goals. Uh, Fusion was recognized as one of five priorities in um, their Net Zero Game Changers initiative. And so we think about working backwards. I mean, the, the White House basically uh, reached out and, and challenged all of us at, at the DOE and in the Fusion ecosystem to think about what will it take uh, so that we can impact mid-century um, climate targets. Uh, for, uh, um, you know, with Fusion uh, able to contribute to that. So what that means is, um, well, I should have uh, started from backwards. What that means is in the 2040s, we would like to be able to be in a position to be uh, deploying commercial Fusion. And so working backwards from there in the 2030s, we would like to be operating pilot plants and hopefully first of a kind commercial plants. And that gives us the remainder of this decade into the early 30s to really resolve those key remaining s and challenges. Uh, energy gain uh, by the commercially uh, relevant systems, as well as tackling a number of still daunting challenges relating to materials, fuel cycle, and other enabling technologies. And the other thing I'll point out is because of this aggressive timeline, we don't want to wait until technical viability is demonstrated in order to prepare that path to commercialization. Um, and we very much want Fusion to be a leader in supporting an equitable clean energy transition. Um, so would like to uh, credit this slide to Dr. John Paul Alon, who's um, our new Associate Director of Science for Fusion Energy Sciences at the DOE. Um, it's imperative for the U.S. to remain a fusion energy world leader. You know, since the White House event in 2022, uh, many other countries are, are recognizing um, the same opportunities, a partnership with the private sector uh, to accelerate their own efforts um, to, to bring fusion to the grid. And there are just some examples of new uh, investment amounts um, announced by various uh, nations around the world. Um, and also, of course, uh, China is not sitting still and, and is really uh, uh, putting a lot of resources uh, to our fusion as well. So we are at an inflection point today between fusion science and fusion energy development. Um, however, yet uh, significant R&D challenges do remain. And this plot is intended to show you know, kind of the three pillars of s and challenges needed to get to a viable fusion pilot plant. The top one is the fusion source itself, the, the plasma physics of reaching net gain conditions. And that's what the world has really been focused on since the beginning of, of fusion R&D in, in the 1950s. Um, and so that's uh, understandably at the highest TRL level. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, both Andrew and I mentioned, a NIF did uh, demonstrate scientific energy gain uh, in December 2022. So this is about predicting, controlling, and sustaining a burning plasma. And we still need to get from that scientific queue of one up to much higher values to, to be uh, needed in a commercially attractive system. Um, but secondly, you need you know, a, a plant structure or surrounding that can survive the extreme heat and irradiation flux at the first wall of a fusion system. So that is largely a materials problem, but it is also, you know, a, a problem of creativity. Maybe there are ways to use liquid or other uh, phases of, of materials um, to, to try to help solve that challenge as well. And then finally, closing the fuel cycle. 
um, especially uh, for DT systems, uh, tritium breeding, processing, and containment. So those have lower TRLs, and uh, both the National Academy's report as well as a recent uh, Fusion Energy Sciences Advisory Committee report really emphasize the need for us to uh, redouble our efforts and make larger investments, especially in those second two pieces, uh, in order to uh, resolve those challenges in a timely fashion. And so uh, I also credit J.P. Alon for this slide. Um, so he has uh, recently announced a new vision for a balanced and bold fusion energy sciences program within the DOE. Um, and I'll just point out that, um, kind of repeating what I just said, but fulfilling the fusion energy mission demands a shift in the balance of research toward fusion materials and technology. Uh, and, and so they are um, uh, underway working with the fusion community to develop a fusion science and technology roadmap um, of how to get there uh, in terms of resolving those s and challenges, um, but also supporting public-private partnerships to accelerate those efforts as well as leveraging international collaborations, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. Um, let me skip that in the interest of time. Also, for the benefit of uh, maybe some new uh, members in the audience to Fusion, I just want to mention there are um, kind of three overall classes of Fusion approaches um, that are uh, being pursued pretty seriously. We are in a period of fertile innovation uh, that benefit from decades of public investments. On the left is magnetic confinement fusion, probably the best well known to most of you here. It's the basis of ITER. Uh, Tokamak is the leading uh, magnetic confinement concept. There are many, many companies uh, listed below there pursuing uh, some form of magnetic confinement. On the right hand side is inertial confinement, kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of uh, the, the fuel density. Um, and uh, that the National Ignition Facility um, is an inertial confinement fusion uh, approach. There are companies there too, especially galvanized by the NIF result. And then in the middle, something called magneto-inertial fusion, uh, and there are several companies there too. I want to mention the DOE milestone-based fusion development program. This is a centerpiece and first step of the bold decadal vision for realizing an operating fusion pilot plant in the 2030s. Um, and uh, in this program, um, awardees will deliver fusion pilot plant preconceptual designs and technology roadmaps within 18 months. Uh, they and their partners, including national labs and universities, will pursue the R&D to resolve SNT challenges and issues up to delivering fusion pilot plant preliminary designs. Oh, I don't know why this is, uh, okay. Um, over five years. Um, they will receive federal fixed payments and upon milestone completion uh, while bringing their own very significant private funding, well over 50% of, the, of their total project costs. Uh, they will also um, Im implement community benefit plans. Um, you know, we want them to engage uh, their local communities early um, uh, to build a social license. Um, though there's the logos of the eight teams. I just want to emphasize that this is a diversified portfolio of companies, fusion concepts, as well as commercialization approaches. Um, in conjunction uh, with resolving the remaining s and challenges, DOE and the U.S. government seek to partner broadly with fusion stakeholders to enable timely fusion commercialization. Uh, don't want to read the whole list, but you see, um, you know, the, none of these things are surprising, but we have to, um, you know, kind of lay the groundwork for all of those areas for successful future fusion deployment. Um, and just kind of, you'll have access to these slides, and I'm just kind of pointing out some of the various uh, activities that we have pursued both within the DOE and with our interagency partners uh, to kind of push these broader areas that go beyond just pursuing the R&D for a fusion pilot plant. Um, and I uh, do want to emphasize um, that we are also uh, have announced a new U.S. Fusion International strategy that focuses our R&D collaborations. You know, we've had long time R&D collaborations with partner countries, you know, for many, many decades. But this new strategy focuses those collaborations and also expands into new activities that support the eventual uh, commercialization. 
And so there's five pillars there. Um, Sec uh, Secretary, former Secretary John Kerry uh, announced this uh, strategy at COP28 last uh, December. And then also uh, just before that, um, we announced a US-UK strategic partnership. And there'll, there'll be more uh, international um, activities coming. And I'll close by saying, you know, DOE uh, very much supports the NRC's fusion rulemaking efforts under the byproduct materials framework. Um, we coordinate with the NRC on our international engagements, for example, with the IAEA, um, definitely support the idea of international harmonization uh, for fusion regulatory frameworks. Um, we seek to support the safety and security of eventual fusion uh, deployment through expanded materials and fuel cycle RD&D. This includes development of codes and tools that will underpin fusion plant designs, accident analysis, estimates of tritium inventory and waste generation, and future licensing applications. Um, DOE stands ready to provide objective technical information and expertise on fusion, including uh, from uh, our experts at, at our national laboratories. Um, and also, I'll just finish by saying DOE encourages broad public engagement on fusion rulemaking, um, and that will help facilitate public trust and a social license for commercial fusion deployment. Thank you, and I look forward to our discussion in, in a moment. Thank you, Scott. Really appreciate the, oh, where'd you go? Uh, <laughs> DOE's partnership on these issues and, and look forward to our discussion. So next up is my buddy Elise to talk about our rulemaking. So take it away, Elise. Thanks, Teresa. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending this uh, last session of the RIC. I am Elise Bolger. I am an intergovernmental liaison program manager with the NRC's Office of Nuclear Material Safety and Safeguards. Um, and as Teresa mentioned earlier, I'm also one of the technical leads for the, the fusion room making uh, that we are doing at the NRC currently. Um, so, so far this morning, we've heard uh, Andrew provide the perspectives from the industry, providing some uh, where their progress is and their challenges, and then we just heard Dr. Shu provide uh, the federal government's promotional activities for commercial fusion uh, power. And uh, I will now go on to describe the, the basis and background for the NRC's fusion rulemaking uh, activities, as well as the, the process by which we are revising our current regulatory framework uh, to make the way for fusion. Okay. So this all started with the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act, or NEMA, which was enacted on January 14th, 2019. Uh, NEMA directs the NRC to develop a regulatory infrastructure to support the development and commercialization of advanced nuclear reactors. Uh, and by this, this definition of advanced nuclear reactors includes both fission and fusion reactors. NEMA additionally requires the NRC to complete a rulemaking to establish a technology-inclusive regulatory framework by December 31st, 2027. In response to NEMA and due to continued development of the commercial uh, fusion technologies. Uh, in 2020, the commission directed the NRC staff to consider appropriate treatment of fusion reactor designs in our regulatory structure by developing options for the commission to consider on licensing and regulating fusion. On January 3rd, 2023, NRC staff sent the commission SECI 23-001 options for licensing and regulating fusion energy systems. This paper presented three options to support the development of a regulatory framework for fusion systems. The first option was to regulate fusion under a utilization facility framework. Uh, option number two was to regulate under a byproduct material framework. And the third and final option was to use a hybrid approach that would initially regulate fusion under a byproduct material framework and introduce decision criteria to license and regulate fusion under a utilization facility framework based on an assessment of potential hazards. On April 13, 2023, the commission approved the implementation of option two, which would regulate near-term fusion systems under the byproduct material framework. Specifically, staff were directed to perform limited scope rulemaking to revise Part 30 of the NRC regulations as well as associated regulations. Uh, NRC staff were also directed to account for existing fusion systems that are licensed and regulated by agreement states, 
develop a new volume of the new reg 1556 consolidated guidance about materials licenses dedicated to fusion systems and evaluate whether controls by design approaches, export controls, or other controls are necessary for near-term fusion systems. Additionally, the, the commission directed that if a determination is made that an anticipated fusion design presents hazards significantly beyond those of a near-term fusion technology, NRC staff should notify the commission and make recommendations for taking appropriate action as needed. Um, I'll just note uh, that fusion is being regulated under the, bi as it's being regulated under the byproduct material framework, we have started using the term fusion system uh, in our, our discussions. Okay, so what is the byproduct materials framework? Part 30 and the, the associated regulations that are included in parts 31 through 37, as well as part 39, provide a framework for licensing byproduct materials. This framework is used to regulate a plethora of uses and quantities of byproduct materials, ranging from portable nuclear density gauges to nuclear medicine uh, to commercial irradiators. Uh, the byproduct material uh, regulations are scalable, provide a comprehensive list of technical and regulatory areas required for licensing, and have been used to regulate the potential hazards and risks, risks from an extensive spectrum of uses of byproduct material. This framework ensures that access to and use of radioactive materials is limited, that only individuals with appropriate training and qualifications handle and use radioactive materials, an adequate level of safety and security is maintained, that it is flexible to encompass the diverse uses of radioactive materials, and uh, reasonable instructions are imposed on licensees. Okay. One aspect of regulating fusion systems under the byproduct materials framework is that agreement states will be able to regulate fusion under their purview. To become an agreement state, a state enters into an agreement with the NRC upon which the NRC relinquishes portions of its regulatory authority to the state. This typically includes authority to license and regulate byproduct materials. Currently, there are 39 agreement states, which are indicated on the map in the darker blue states. Um, the remaining states are NRC and, and US territories fall under NRC jurisdiction, as indicated by the lighter blue and the green states. Uh, those three green states, uh, Connecticut, Indiana, and West Virginia, uh, have been coded differently since they are currently, um, have submitted their intent to become agreement states, and we expect next year for Connecticut and Indiana to be agreement states with West Virginia a little bit farther down the road. Um, additionally, uh, while Wyoming is an agreement state, their agreement is limited to uranium milling activities covered under Part 40, and therefore NRC still remains regulatory authority for byproduct materials in that state. Uh, it is of a particular interest to note that of the 25 commercial fusion companies headquartered in the US, all are in agreement states. As indicated on the map, there are eight companies headquartered in California, four in New Jersey, there are three companies both in Wisconsin and Washington, two each in Massachusetts, Virginia and Colorado, and one in Texas. At least this was current uh, in uh, uh, July of 2023 uh, with the Fusion Industry Report. Um, so therefore, as you can see, all of these are located in agreement states, and therefore it has been very important for this rulemaking that the NRC works closely with our agreement state partners. Um, and they have been actively participating in the, the fusion systems rulemaking from the very beginning. When the NRC discontinues and the state assumes regulatory authority, agreement state programs are required to provide reasonable assurance of protection of public health and safety in the regulation of radioactive materials. Further, agreement state programs must have regulations, procedures, and guidance that are compatible with the NRCs. Agreement state compatibility ensures that with 40 different regulatory authorities, a cohesive national materials program exists. Oversight of the agreement state programs, as well as the NRC's materials program, is performed via the Integrated Materials Performance Evaluation Program, or IMPEP. Additionally, the NRC reviews state regulations and other legally binding requirements to ensure that the program elements remain adequate to protect public health and safety and compatible with the NRC's requirements following revisions to federal rules, uh, rulemaking. 
All right, so as far as the current status of the fusion rulemaking, the NRC is currently in the process of drafting the proposed rule and guidance. So as you can see shown in this graphic, we're, we're still at the initial stages of the rulemaking process. Our next step will be to send our draft proposed rule to the commission for review and publication in the Federal Register for public comment. This public comment period will be at least 60 days. After evaluation of public comments, the NRC will revise the rule and guidance as needed and provide the draft final rule for commission approval. Following approval of the rule, it will be published in the Federal Register and come into effect. Uh, typically, agreement state programs have three years to adopt new regulations. Okay. Following the Commission's decision to regulate fusion systems under, byproduct, under the byproduct materials framework, the NRC established a rulemaking working group comprised of both NRC and agreement state staff. The rulemaking working group has been very active with stakeholder engagement. Um, since the onset of rulemaking activities, the NRC has held six uh, public meetings and several government-to-government -government -government meetings. During these meetings, we have shared preliminary draft versions of the rulemaking language and, guide and the guidance document. Um, members of industry, academia, state and tribal governments, as well as the public, have participated and provided feedback during these meetings. Additionally, the NRC has been building our capabilities and knowledge through participation in both international and domestic fusion-related conferences and meetings. With all the unknowns in the design of fusion systems, the working group has focused on designing a flexible and resilient regulatory framework that will allow for the diversity of fusion technologies, will ad identify radiological hazards, and will encompass safety significant designs and programmatic elements. Okay. Regarding the changes to the NRC regulations, the draft proposed rule would add a new definition for fusion system in parts 20 and 30 and would update the definition of particle accelerator in parts 20, 30, and 110. The proposed rule would also add technology-inclusive contents of application requirements, supportive of a performance-based approach to regulating fusion systems. The contents of application section would provide the requirements for licensing of a fusion system that would be supplemental, supplemented by the current general regulatory requirements and terms and conditions uh, for licensees already contained in Part 30. Specifically, the draft proposed rule would add a new paragraph to Section 3032 application for specific licenses. This new paragraph would require the applicants for a fusion system license to provide general description of the system and facility, description and scope of operating and emergency procedures, the organizational structure, information on training, inspection, and maintenance programs, and the material inventory processes. Uh, considering the possibility that fusion systems will generate activation products that are not included in the waste classification tables in Part 61, NRC staff are also proposing to expand a section of 20.2008. A new paragraph of 20.2008 would require that disposal sites that accept fusion system waste complete a site-specific assessment to demonstrate protection of individuals from inadvertent intrusion based on the waste acceptance criteria for the disposal site. As much as the byproduct material framework is, as much as the byproduct material framework is covered in guidance, NRC staff have also been working to develop a new new reg, uh, 1556 volume, which will provide licensing guidance for fusion system applicants. This guidance is being developed uh, to include fusion systems for uh, research and development as well as commercial deployment. The guidance is technology neutral and focuses on byproduct material and associated radi radiation hazards. Uh, leveraging information contained in other new Reg 1556 volumes, the working group has worked to develop guidance that emphasizes the handling and control of radioactive material to protect radiation workers, members of the public, and the environment. Consistent with the byproduct framework, a fusion licensee will be a license will be limited to sp the specific co components such as the fusion device, tritium handling systems, and breeding blanket. Um, and we recently uh, have completed and made publicly available the preliminary draft licensing guidance. Uh, this slide shows uh, the topics that are covered in the, the new Reg 1556 guidance, uh, which includes uh, the types and forms of radioactive material to be used, possessed, and produced, uh, purposes for which 
the licensed material will be used. Um, this could include uh, tritium as the, the fusion system fuel, as well as activation products that will be produced inadvertently due to the fusion reactions. Uh, qualifications for radiation safety officer, as well as individuals responsible for the radiation safety program. Training for those individuals that will be working in re uh, restricted areas fusion facility and equipment uh, descriptions, uh, radiation protection programs such as dissymmetry and contamination controls, as well as waste management. Regarding our upcoming milestones, uh, next month the NRC will begin our internal review of the draft proposed rule and guidance, as well as provide uh, advanced copies to the agreement states for review. Um, we will then be on track to provide the draft proposed rule with the new Reg 1556 volume to the Commission in September of this year. To ensure that we meet the December 31st, 2027 NEMA guideline, uh, deadline, we will be planning to have the proposed rule published in the Federal Register uh, in the spring of 2025, and then to provide the final rule to the Commission in the summer of 2026. By meeting these milestones, the final rule is expected to be published uh, in the Federal Register in the spring of 2027. And I'll just uh, also announce that next week, we'll, on Monday, March 18th at 1 p.m., we will be hosting another public meeting. Uh, this will be discussing our preliminary draft guidance, uh, which we made publicly available last week, uh, as well as some recent changes to the proposed definitions of fusion system and accelerator. So you can find that on our public uh, meeting notice website. Thank you, and if you have questions about our rulemaking, you can contact me, uh, Duncan or Dennis, uh, and you can find more information on our public website as well as on regulations.gov. Thanks very much for that, Elise, and for promoting our other meetings. And we'll go next to our regulatory partner, Beth Shelton, from the state of Tennessee. Good morning, everybody. Um, so like Teresa said, I'm Beth Shelton with the Division of Radiological Health in the state of Tennessee. I'm the uh, director there. I'm also um, the chair-elect for the Organization of Agreement States. We'll get into a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, so when I was asked to do this presentation back in January, I was like, well, I mean, why me? We don't have a fusion facility in Tennessee. And they're like, oh, but you can do it on the OAS perspective. Well, now we have someone coming to Tennessee. So for a month and a half now, I have changed my way of thinking about this presentation. So you're going to hear it on both sides. <laughs> So we have two national organizations that are really there to help support the agreement states. One of them is the Organization of Agreement States, and that is one that I'm uh, chair-elect right now. And the purpose of OAS is to provide a mechanism for these agreement states to work with each other and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on regulatory issues. One of the big things that we do is we um, work with the NRC on different working groups. When the NRC needs somebody from a state to be on a working group, um, we reach out to the states to try to find someone that has that expertise. Uh, another thing that we do is we, we uh, send in many comment letters about any kind of um, regulation amendments or um, guidance documents that are coming out. We'll collect those comments from the states and try to give it a little bit more oomph to uh, get it to NRC. And um, then we also, if there's a state that's kind of in need of something, if they're struggling, um, for instance, fusion or something, and they need help from another state, we try to help get those states the contact information that they need and, or reach out to NRC and get help. So then there's also the Conference of Radiation Control Program Directors, um, CRCPD, and they um, do a lot of the same things that the OAS does, but they also include x-ray in their, um, their duties and um, so one of their big things, they're a lot larger than OAS and have a lot more resources, but they have right now at least 70 working groups that are working on any kind of um, guidance. And one of the big things that they release is the suggested state regulations. When NRC um, you know, has regulations that come out, it's, no, it's in y'all's language, it's in the NRC language, and so the states have to put it into state language, and the suggested state regulations that the CRCPD write 
can help us get to that language a little bit easier and faster. So I think the big thing that has come out, I've been, I've been with the state of um, Tennessee for almost 25 years now. And in the past, it wasn't so cooperative and um, just a lovely relationship, um, partnership kind of situation. But I would say the last, I don't know, 10 years, eight, 10 years, um, it has been a real partnership and working in, you know, hand in hand with the NRC. And a lot of that comes in um, when we started talking about the National Materials Program. And what the mission for the NMP is to create a genuine partnership between the NRC and the agreement states that will ensure the protection of public health, safety, security, and the environment from the hazards associated with radioactive materials. Really, the big thing is we, uh, we need each other. Uh, the states, a lot of times, see technologies before the NRC sees them because we license so many people, so many more um, different types, especially medical. When medical comes in, we're seeing them a lot faster than the NRC, and so we need each other, and the NMP allows that. It allows um, the states to be in there from the beginning at the ground level. So, like uh, Lee said, there are certain states that are already dealing with fusion um, facilities and regulating them across the U.S. Not very many, but a few, and um, you know, they a lot of them they have either they're working on licensing for research and development activities, or they have the license for research and development activities. Um, another big aspect that a lot of people don't think about is you also have to. Uh, register, do a certified registration for the particle accelerator for a fusion facility. So that kind of brings in, like for Tennessee, our, our x-ray and our materials are on separate, or the same division, but different programs. Well, we're going to have to bring that together to do, to license and register this type of facility. So we're kind of going through the thought process on that. Okay, so that's really small, and I forgot my glasses at home in Tennessee. Um, so, um, fusion, fusion system rulemaking expectations, Elise did a great job of explaining what was gonna be happening with the rulemaking coming out. And I can tell you from a state that is now knowing that we're gonna have a fusion facility, I'm very happy to hear all of that information. I think that is gonna be very helpful. It's gonna enable um, the applicants to have um, some consistent guidance and um, it's gonna make everything predictable and reliable across the entire NMP. So I've already kind of been into this a little bit, but there is a policy statement, agreement state policy program. Pol Agreement State Program Policy Statement. This is also very small. Um, the NRC and agreement states will cooperate in the development of both new and revised regulations and policies. Agreement states will have early and substantive involvement in the development of regulations affecting protection of public health and safety. That's key. As long as we are, you know, working together and. Um, which we are, um, I think that's going to help everybody. We can um, all, I think, agree on that. So currently there are a lot of activities going on. Elise mentioned some that the NRC is participating in as far as fusion. Um, last year during the 2023 OAS annual meeting, I'll do a plug, it's a very interesting meeting if you ever want to come out. Um, this year's is in August in California. Um, so we, um, last year's meeting we had a fusion day. It was an entire day specified for fusion. Um, the morning was a panel of agreement state people, NRC, and the industry people. And it really went into detail what, what is, what's happening right now as far as how the states are regulating it. And it also gave us perspective of the technologies out there from the industry. Um, then we had actually got to tour Helion because we were in Seattle. Um, so it was, I think, a very productive day and a lot of people got a lot of information out of it. Um, the CRCPD currently has their E47 committee um, working on developing a white paper that will outline the risk-based risk approach for state regulation and commercial fusion facilities. Um, I think, I can't wait to read that one. I'm hoping um, to get a copy. I know it's draft right now, I think. Um, so hopefully we'll be getting that soon. 
So this is probably the most important slide for me right now, and it really shouldn't be like this. It really probably needs to be like the top of my brain, and it just like question marks and like just things shooting out of it, um, because that's kind of how I feel right now as an agreement state. I know there's there's all kinds of information out there and people to help, but when you're first getting into a new technology and um, trying to figure out where to go next, it's, it's a little overwhelming. So some of the things that have come to mind, um, training. You know, the NRC gives us amazing training for the Agreement State staff. And um, I know they're developing uh, training for Fusion, but I'm not sure when it's gonna be available and I'm not sure when we will be able to get everybody in the U.S. In, into this training class. So, um, so that's a little bit of a worry to me, and it's kind of made me try to think outside the box and try to figure out another way to get training for my staff until we can get the NRC training. Licensing assistance, I think the big challenge there, and um, we've already started reaching out to the other states that have fusion facilities, so that's good. Um, and most of them have been very willing to talk to us and meet with us, even offered for us to come there and visit. Um, so that's, that's huge, having that licensing assistance. And when the new reg and the regs come out, that will be very helpful. Um, one thing that came up this week that I, didn't, I hadn't heard about until not this week. Um, the Fusion Design Specific Registry, I think it's probably a good idea. Um, I haven't, you know, heard too much into it, but it would be where it would make it easier for a Fusion facility, a Fusion device, particular device to be put on a registry that um, if someone in Tennessee was licensing the same type of device where, I mean, you're still going to have to do site specific and, you know, analysis, but it could, if that same device is being used in Wisconsin, then it would make the, the licensing process faster, most likely. So it's something to think about, and I think it's just in the early stages of thought, but I think it would be a good idea. Um, emergency preparedness, we don't really know yet what we're gonna have to do and what, how much resources are gonna have to be um, made available for emergency preparedness. I don't think it would be anything like a nuclear power plant exercise where our entire staff is out in the field all day long. I don't think it's anything like that, but it's something we think about and when I'm trying to do a workload analysis and figure out if we need extra people, um, just, thoughts in my head. Um, one thing that's not up here that I would suggest for other states, um, even, you know, even licensees, we, what we do, it's in our regs that we will do environmental sampling around these types of facilities. It has really helped us um, with public, with the public when they come to us and say, oh, we don't believe what so-and-so is saying they're getting, and we're able to say, well, here's our, our sampling. And so it gives a little bit of a credibility for the licensee, and it helps with, you know, it just helps with that public outreach type of stuff. So um, I would suggest that for anybody that, um, any other state or NRC. <laughs> and that's all I have. <laughs> So thanks so much, Beth, and thanks to the whole panel. See, so you had plenty to say, even though you weren't sure you'd, what you were going to say, but we knew that you would have a lot of great perspectives. Um, and I think that that mindset of, I don't know, I don't have any fusion in my house. Oh, wait, here's a whole bunch of fusion is something that we're going to all be seeing over the next few years. It's something, you know, there's really a moment right now, and we're all adapting to it. So I um, appreciate getting these different perspectives across the panel. We are starting to get a number of questions online. Any of you, or as well as the people out in cyberspace, can add questions and we'll uh, prioritize them here in the queue. We may not get to them all, but I'll try to combine them up a little bit and we have quite a decent amount of time. Thank you all for staying on schedule, <laughs> even though I didn't use the hook. Um, <laughs> so I'll toss the first question to Andrew at my right. Um, Andrew, you used this, this metaphor of uh, the Wright brothers and kind of getting off the ground. And, and what did you see as fusion first taking flight? And how are you defining that flight and kind of what the next steps are? Yeah, 
when I said that the Wright brothers' plane took off, it, it was the National Ignition Facility. It was when, when the NIF uh, in December of 2022 announced that they'd gotten more energy out than in. Now, some of the scientists will tell me, well, actually, they got ignition a, a whole year earlier, so it was the scientific regime was already there. And, uh, uh, but, you know, they, it, it's, uh, we get it. Um, but we, we now have it in, in one technology type. And like I said, multiple companies are building in their own technology type. So, you know, to, to extend and maybe torture the analogy of, of uh, aviation a little bit, you know, the Wright Flyer was the first, but it wasn't, wasn't necessarily the one that was commercialized. It doesn't mean, but, you know, Wright Brothers, uh, you know, became a, a, a significant supplier to um, first the, the military and, and also to, um, uh, you know, mail, the air, air mail sort of stuff. So there is, a, we, we are now in this moment, um, you know, I just read a, the, the, uh, the great biography of the Wright brothers, and, and one of the really interesting things was from that December 1903 moment until basically like 1908, 1909, people didn't really believe them until they saw it. And so, so that's one of the really interesting things that we have to do now is we have to go out and demonstrate to the, to the public, to you all, to the regulators, to the government, that this is happening and this is coming sooner than you think. And so, so that's you know, partly my role, partly you know, our companies and, and scientists out there you know, getting the, the awareness out there. You know, it, pretty soon these things will be coming in for, for license applications, will be coming in to, you know, other regulators for, you know, grid hookup applications and all that sort of stuff. So we got to make sure everybody's ready. Um, that's, the, the, again, tortured analogy, but I, I think it, it helps on the mindset. Thanks, and it helps with that kind of spirit of imagination that we're all feeling here, too. So Beth mentioned environmental sampling and that uh, collected with a couple of questions here about environmental reviews in general for fusion and how we're planning to handle those. Elise, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, currently we have for uh, some environmental rules uh, reviews under part 51 of our regulations. Uh, for uh, research and development, we have a categorical goal exemption for that, so that means that they would not have to go through an environmental review, uh, which at this point is what I see you know, most fusion applications coming in as. Um, but once we go towards the, the commercialization aspect uh, of fusion systems, uh, those will have to go through uh, probably some sort of environmental review at this time. Um, that being said, that states uh, do not have the same NEPA requirements, uh, so they may have their, uh, their own imposed rules or they may not have anything, so it will vary uh, from location to location what you're going to see as far as an environmental review. And Beth, did you want to add to that at all for Tennessee regs? Well, we don't deal with NEPA in my, in my division, so um, so I really don't have much to add there. I think it is something that we've talked a lot about here and something we want to um, definitely bring up at OAS and see where um, what we need to do as far as, um, because it will depend state to state. Thanks, and this is a hot topic that we're talking about in our rulemaking process as well. Just to add to what Elise said, of those 17,000 materials licensees that are out there, many of them, given the decades of experience that we have with them, do fall into these categorical exclusions from doing a formal environmental review under the um, National Environmental Policy Act. However, Fusion doesn't have that experience basis yet, so we're anticipating doing those Part 51 environmental reviews in the near term and, and kind of see how things go from there. prioritize these a little bit. Um, I think, let me throw a couple of international questions Scott's way. So there's a couple of different internationally related questions um, about how we're harmonizing internationally and then what process, progress is being made at the international level. Do you have maybe from a research or a funding perspective opinions to share? 
Yeah, so in term, the first one, in terms of the harmonization, um, I mean, we have bilateral discussions, you know, with, our, with, with many partner uh, countries um, on, on these types of topics, you know, on the regulatory frameworks, on uh, non approaches to non-proliferation and things like that. And, and of course, through the IAEA as well, the IAEA is ramping up their level of activities around fusion. Uh, there's many ongoing studies, and they're going to be putting out reports and, and things like that. So that's one avenue um, where the harmonization discussions are occurring, a couple of avenues. Um, in terms of the more bro the broader international uh, engagements and implementation of the U.S. strategy, again, it is through uh, uh, many separate bilateral um, discussions right now. Um, we've announced publicly the U.S.-U.K. strategic partnership. There's a couple of other, um, uh, at least from our perspective, priority partnerships that we would also like to roll out, um, you know, in the near future. Um, and I didn't have a, a chance in my talk to go over those five pillars, but first and foremost is still to, uh, you know, find ways that we can work together to resolve those S&T challenges. You know, there's many costly test facilities, and we want to be able to find a way to, part, you know, with our close allies and partners, not have to do all of them by ourselves. <laughs> so that's that's one area. But in all these other commercialization areas too, we would like to be able to work with uh, our partners. You know, certainly at bilateral levels, and potentially even in some multilateral levels. Can I add add on that too? Um, you know, we increasingly see. That yes, there is. It is really important that there's cooperation, uh, and there's a long history of, of cooperation internationally in fusion. But I, I can also report that there is increasingly kind of a geopolitical competition happening here in fusion. Um, the reason maybe I'm a little more tired than I usually would be is I, I was on a um, a roundtable this morning with the European Commission, the Commissioner for. Research. Uh, she hosted a, a high-level roundtable, uh, and so I was up at five o'clock this morning, participating in that virtually. Uh, and and they categorically stated, "We want the first pilot plant to be built in Europe." I've heard the same thing from the Germans, which of course would be Europe. Heard the same thing from the UK. Uh, so, very clearly, countries want to work together, and there's there's really important things that that we can work together on. But we need to be aware that, that people are racing towards this, and, and Scott had the, the roadmap that the Chinese put together. Um, we see very significant movement from, from the Chinese government towards um, figuring out how they're going to commercialize fusion energy as well. Thanks, and I think I'll stick with you for a second, Andrew. So there's a question in the queue that um, was directed at us, but I'm going to spin it at you. Um, <laughs> So when we wrote the commission paper that Elise mentioned, we described this phrase called near-term designs. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of information in, in the paper and its enclosures that talks about what we meant when we said near-term. It's mm -hmm. things, you know, no off-site doses, you know, no use of special nuclear materials, the sorts of things that you were talking about, Andrew, as well. Are you seeing anything on the horizon that's not near-term, and what, what sort of what sort of things do you have in your mind as an industry to approach that? Well, Teresa, thanks for, for bringing up the area where we disagree with you. <laughs> Fundamentally, the FIA does not see anything uh, on the horizon from our members that would not, not fit in under that, that near-term categorization. We, we think that it's, it's important uh, to build the regulatory certainty here for the industry. You know, we, and so when we, when we sometimes say this, oh, you're only doing near term, and, and I hear this from, from um, NRC or others, and, you know, we want to leave the options open, it's, it's like, we get it. The options are always open. The commission can always impose a utilization facility approach on anything they see coming and anything they see coming in. Um, to date, we don't see anything proposed for the United States, put it that way. Um, there is, of course, you know, uh, murmurings every so often that, that pop out of China or Russia on some sort of fusion-fission hybrid, but that we don't think would be a, a challenge at all. I think 
fundamentally, uh, it, because it has um, special nuclear material, a fusion-fission hybrid would obviously fit under the utilization facility approach. And second on that, you know, the regulator can always just say no. And so we don't see anything like that coming in the United States and, uh, or, you know, similarly like-minded like countries. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, it's important to, to be able to build that, turn the short term into the long term. Thanks for that, and I agree in the short term. Um, <laughs> we'll see about the future. Um, that's great. Thanks for providing that perspective. Um, Beth, you talked a little bit about the design registry, and that, that opened up something that I think our audience, which may have more of a nuclear power background, you know, I mentioned in our intro, and Elise also mentioned the tremendous number of licensees under the materials framework. And so when folks are talking about scale up, what sorts of things do you think we already have in the materials framework that enables scale up and consistency? I think you can kind of use um, like the sealed source and device registry, for instance, um, to, we could use something like that uh, really to design something like this. I, I will say one thing, I, I, it, it would be nice to just, it would be nice to have it and be able to um, take that part of the regulate, of regulating it. Sorry, I'm just, it, it, to me, it's the sealed source and device with, is what came to mind when I read about it. And then also on the x-ray side, it just, with us and having to um, look up new types of x-ray devices, having something like that for x-ray. I mean, I know the x-ray is not um, what we're talking about here, but it's something we do every day for new types of um, technology. And it would make it so much easier if there was something out there we could easily look at. And so that comes to mind. It would be like we would be able to say, oh, type 1 energy, this is the type of um, device you're going to bring into the state of Tennessee. Let's look on this registry. And it's already been approved in some manner, whether it's NRC, agreement states, organization of agreements, CRCB, whatever. But it's just really kind of um, put out there as um, reciprocity is another example of that. Um, sorry, all over the place. But yeah, um, I think those are definitely. Thanks, Beth. Um, I wanted that to come out of a mouth other than mine because I talk about this stuff a lot too. Um, medical is another example where you know we license medical nationwide and have consistent licensing guidance that's used. So this is a strategy piece that the NRC is thinking about and is going to be working more with the states on. Um, after we can take a breath from getting this chunk of the rulemaking out. So, um, Scott, I'll come back to you, I think. So one, one of the questions for you is quite loaded about whether <laughs> the U.S. government should significantly increase its support of fusion. You can decide whether or not to answer that. But another piece is more concretely, what are you planning on de-risking technology and helping uh, bring that to market? Because that's a big challenge in first-of-a-kind generation. Um, thanks. Well, I can easily say I don't have the power to do an <laughs> uh, do anything about either of those questions, but <laughs> but, but I will say, um, you know, I, I mentioned how fusion is at an inflection point, and I, I think it, it is a matter of our collective will and investment um, that will determine um, how quickly we can get there. So, you know, we are working uh, certainly on the DOE side to have those conversations, you know, throughout government to try to build the support. Uh, that, that's what we can do. Um, uh, in terms of the de-risking, I mean, we, we do want to do the most we have, uh, the most with what we have uh, of what Congress gives us. Um, and I mentioned uh, we have a new associate director um, for Fusion Energy Sciences, and he is uh, doing a great job um, trying to look ahead and how to realign uh, our fusion energy sciences program uh, with de-risking those uh, remaining S&T challenges um, and doing it in a way that um, leverages, uh, you know, our partnerships with the private sector and with international partners, et cetera. So that, that's what we're going to be uh, really trying to do um, in, the, in the very near future at the DOE. Thanks for that. So Andrew, you might offer some industry perspectives on this in, in the 
vision. Mm -hmm. Why? never get that word right in my brain. Community, we talk a lot about the front and the back end of the fuel cycle, and there's a couple of questions here about um, fuel infusion perspective. Where are you gonna get the tritium that you need? And then what do you see the waste streams being? You know, you mentioned low-level waste in your talk, and I know some of this is under active discussion in the rulemaking, but your perspectives in those sides. Okay, um, I, I always tell people here, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I sometimes play one on TV. Uh, so it, when it, this is a challenge for me because there is so many different technologies within the FIA and eh, honestly everybody has a different way that they, they want to do it and you know the science isn't there yet so tritium uh, at this point the main sources of tritium uh, for um, F FIA member companies are Canadian uh, can-do reactors um, there is, as I understand it, uh, certain you know, possibilities to um, actually increase tritium production from them in the future, but obviously that's also a, a, a finite source. Uh, and so uh, I can report that, that some actually of our member companies are looking at the possibility of, of becoming um, tritium fuel producers before they, they move into power plants. Interesting, you know, tritium is actually really expensive, $30,000 a gram or something right, like that right now. So it's, so there's a market. The market, if, if somebody's a buyer, you know, some, you can figure out a way to, to buy it. So, you know, we actually don't think it's a huge worry. You sometimes see extrapolate, you know, there was a news report a couple of years ago that said, oh, the world's going to run out of tritium in 2045. Well, you know, all things being equal, you, you know, maybe, but all things aren't equal and things change in 20 years. So um, we, think, uh, we think that this is, uh, there, there is going to be enough tritium. It's not physically impossible to make it. Uh, so uh, it will be, you know, we'll, we'll find that. Of course, as Scott was talking about, there is a lot of uncertain science here in, in the fuel, uh, fuel systems and how much tritium any particular power plant is going to need for startup is going to be an open question. But fundamentally, I think for the, the fission audience to know, um, once the power plant is started up, it needs to be self-sufficient in, in tritium. So in actuality, when you, you'd say, you know, traditionally, like what is the fuel source isn't, isn't actually going to be deuterium and tritium, it's going to be deuterium and lithium, because the lithium is what uh, the tritium is generated in. It's the lithium blanket, the neutrons hit the lithium, creates tritium, you cycle that back into the, into the power plant. So y yes, you need, you need to have some, some tritium for startup, um, but you need to be self-sufficient in that. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Um, second question on, um, uh, on waste disposal. Yeah, of course, the waste disposal is fundamentally a, a choice about design. Right, so that's why having the uh, the regulations in place uh, early, so we we can know how to, you know, design these these power plants, design the the plasma facing materials to be able to ensure that these can be, you know, we, we can have the uh, uh, the irradiated irradiated materials go into a, a regime that, that does fit into that low-level waste, um, easily disposed of regime, is important, uh, and we can plan that out. Uh, so, yeah, every company is going to have to have its long-term waste management plan and where it's going to go. I can say that, that we've talked to the, the uh, low-level waste uh, repositories in the United States. They're eager for the business. So. <laughs> All right, thanks for that. Um, so the, the remaining few questions in here are about our regulatory framework that we're actively developing. And so, Elise, I'm going to give you the last question as kind of a softball. Um, if somebody out there in the audience here or online wants to get involved, you said we already had a handful of public meetings. Is it too late for them to get involved? What's, what's the next step and, and how can they participate and learn more about what we're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we do have uh, an upcoming public meeting on, on this upcoming Monday. Um, you can uh, find out information about that on our public website. Um, additionally, um, uh, you can see uh, 
we have uh, information on our public website additionally about what's happened in the past. Uh, you can go uh, and you can find uh, the Adams links to all of the documents and past presentations. Uh, and I think we had one of our meetings was transcribed too, so that'll be in there. Um, we've, uh, if you would uh, like to provide public comments during our public comment period, uh, that when you see it posted in the Federal Register, we would be glad to accept all of those comments uh, that you have. Um, so yeah, it just we have all those documents to review. Uh, we just made publicly available uh, the draft version of our proposed uh, new reg licensing guidance. That's a bit of a beast of a document, uh, several hundred pages. So if you wanted some uh, something to put you to sleep at night, but uh, you can go through that, and we would appreciate any feedback uh, and insights into that and how we can uh, make that document you know the best it can be. Uh, we definitely see this uh, rulemaking as an iterative process as you know things are more refined. I think we're gonna see changes that we'll have to, once we narrow down different technologies that become more pre prevalent. So continue to be involved with uh, our ongoing activities to keep us informed and give us your feedback. All right, great, thanks Lise. It's definitely not too late is the answer there. And don't be scared by the couple hundred pages. It's not a couple hundred pages of fusion stuff. It's a couple hundred pages that includes all of our standard content for every type of license, like where to mail your application and don't forget to have a radiation safety officer and that kind of stuff. So you can flip over those parts if you like. Um, so I'll just close by really thanking our panel. I appreciate all the engagement of everyone. Um, you know, the re regulatory process is a tight collaboration between us and the agreement states, and then we really benefit from the industry and the interagency input to those processes as well. So I know we plan to continue that. And there's a lot of people behind the scenes who helped make this session happen, Elise herself, as well as our question answerers and, and clickers out there in the audience. Um, so I really appreciate all of that. And I will get you to lunch two whole minutes early. Uh, <laughs> thanks for coming to the Rick, and we really are glad to have you all with us here and online. So thank you.